So I won't go into too much of the climate stuff. You know, we've had last year the hottest day, hottest week, hottest month and hottest year records broken in Australia. So I think we know it's pretty scary and that's a picture of the Arctic ice melt. So um, in Bill McKibben's talk when he came here last year, he mentioned some pretty scary numbers. So two degrees is kind of the universally agreed limit for temperature rise we want. It's actually a very problematic target because we've already seen such devastation with one degree that we know we don't want to be aiming for two degrees. But that aside, um, if we did want to keep under two degrees, they're saying that we need, we have a budget of 565 gigatons of CO2 that we can emit to have a chance of staying within this. Um, pretty worryingly, the fossil fuel companies already have 2,795 gigatons of fossil fuels in reserves that they've got ready to burn up and are planning on burning. So that's five times more than the planet can handle. So the basic moral of that story is if they carry out their business plans, the planet tanks and we're pretty much fucked. So we need to rewrite this script and go down a different path. Um, and as Kim already mentioned, uh, capitalism is completely incompatible with environmental sustainability. Um, for these basic reasons, you can have a read, you know, profit, continual expansion and externalising of costs, which I won't go into too much, but I'm sure we all can all appreciate that. Um, and we can't just reform the system or green capitalism because ecological destruction is actually built into the very <coughs> innate, inner logic uh, and nature of the present system of production and distribution. And this is summed up well in the World People's um, Agreement which came out of the 2010 uh, World People's Conference on Climate Change in Cochabamba, Bolivia, which I was privileged enough to be able to go along and attend. Um, and this was a great example of the climate justice movement in the global south, led by the left-wing countries of, of Latin America. Um, and so this is a paragraph out of the People's Agreement that pretty does a good job of describing the capitalist system and why it's incompatible with with an environmental sustainability. Um, so the capitalist system has imposed on, opposed on us a logic of competition, progress and lim limitless growth. This regime of production and consumption seeks profit without limits, separating human beings from nature and imposing a logic of domination upon nature, transforming biodiversity, justice, ethics, the rights of people and life itself. So we know there can be no lasting solution to the environmental crises as long as capitalism is, capitalism is the dominant mode of social and economic production on this planet. Uh, and to quote Eva Morales, the Boliv uh, president of Bolivia, uh, we have two paths, either, cap either capitalism dies or Mother Earth dies. That's basically the general message there. So I identify as an eco-socialist and my party, Socialist Alliance, is a proud eco-socialist party. Um, so eco-socialism is born out of ecology and Marxism. Um, basically ecology gives us the powerful tool for understanding how nature works as an interrelated system um, and offers essential insights into how humans impact the planet. Um, but obviously its weakness is there's a lack of social analysis and it reduces human roles to numbers and biology and um, proposes solutions that tinker around the edges. So what Marxism brings to this, as we know, is a comprehensive critique of capitalism and analysis of why the social order has been so destructive and shows us another way um, and ecology was actually fundamental to the thoughts of both Marx and Engels, as well as many other 20th century Marxists. But on the whole, the Marxist movements of the 20th century have largely ignored um, environmental issues. And we know that large ecological disasters um, have happened under countries that have called themselves socialists. So why would we expect better under a new socialist society? I think we can expect better because um, not yet. <laughs> um, because eliminating capitalism actually makes it possible to have a sustainable society. It doesn't make it inevitable, but um, by eliminating that profit motive and the drive for the accumulation as a force of the um, economy, it removes that innate drive to pollute and destroy. And the other thing that we can hope for better is because we can learn from the past and we can learn from ecology, um, as is demonstrated by Cuba, which today is the only country living Sustainably, sustainably within its environmental footprint according to the World Wildlife, Project, Wildlife Fund. So the lesson we have to learn is that ecology has to have a central place in socialist theory and socialist practice today. So an eco-socialist society would be socialist, committed to democracy, radical egalitarianism and social justice based on the collective ownership of means of production, 
Um, it'll eliminate exploitation and eliminate profit and accumulation as the driving forces of the economy. But it will also be based on best ecological principles, um, stop um, prioritising anti-environmental practices and start restoring ecosystems and re-establishing agriculture and industry practices based on best ecological principles. So now I might just talk about why um, socialists need to be involved in environment campaigns and the movements. Because it's not really enough for us to just critique um, and criticise neoliberal and the liberal responses to the climate crisis, although we should do that as well. Um, we have to actively support and be involved in movements that directly confront the problem. So this means rather than campaigning for market mechanisms, as Kim was saying, um, or vague calls for climate action, we do need to actually build a grassroots mass movement that can call for and demand uh, large-scale renewable energy, um, ideally public, publicly funded and owned, and the immediate phase out of fossil fuels. This is a useful transitional demand because it's absolutely necessary and a practical step towards a fossil free economy. It's technologically achievable and it's something that people can generally support. However, publicly funded and owned uh, energy, nationalised energy production is also a highly controversial demand in a um, climate dominated by neoliberalism and private ownership um, where intervention in the market is, is tried to be minimised. So these demands actually have radicalising potential, I think, because they highlight the contradictions inherent in the capitalist system and its inability to solve the climate crisis, as well as the ultimate need for popular control over the means of production. So a couple of examples of the campaigns that um, Social Science and myself have been involved in um, that I might just have a look at as case studies are the Repower Port Augusta campaign, which um, since 2009 we've been involved in this South Australian campaign, which is where I'm from, um, to replace the ageing coal-fired power stations up at Port Augusta with large-scale solar thermal technology. Um, and this campaign has been strongly... Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a picture of a beautiful solar thermal power station. And there's more info about the campaign at the, those websites. Um, it's been largely grassroots, uh, with powerful displays of people power, um, demonstrated, demonstrated by the community vote in Port Augusta, the walk for solar from Port Augusta to Adelaide, which is about a two-week walk, um, and the rally for solar in Adelaide. We've also been involved in anti-CSG movements, um, movements against unconventional gas around the country. So these have, these have taken off, as people would know, that they've grown in huge numbers over recent years, and they've had some really inspiring campaigns that have brought together a range of different people from different backgrounds um, who are really learning the strength of collective action firsthand by getting involved. And they've given us the opportunity to work alongside a whole range of people we would never would have had the chance to speak to before or talk to about politics um, and really expose a broader cross-section of society to, to our radical politics. And both of these campaigns are useful because they grow activists through the struggle and they demonstrate lessons about people power and, and about how change comes about. People's consciousness develops through the struggle and it triggers different um, questions for people about how society works. And if you're involved in a campaign like this for long enough, you soon realise that politicians don't give concessions out of the goodness of their hearts um, and that they really do serve the interests of the, of the minority elite and including the fossil fuel lobby. Um, so at a community forum, one of the first ones we had up in Port Augusta to talk to the community about this idea of a power station run by solar thermal, um, a crowd, we thought it would be a fairly conservative rural crowd, um, but in question time, a lot of the, the participants stood up and asked questions like, so who would own this power station? Would it just be another big corporation? Um, aren't they just going to screw us over as well? And why shouldn't we own and control it? And don't we own what is in the ground? Isn't that our collective, collective resource? So I think it, that was really um, eye-opening for me, and I, it taught me the lesson to not underestimate the ability of working people to actually come to their own highly developed conclusions through the process of engaging in struggles that affect their own communities directly. And as with all the campaigns we participate in, while we do the on the ground hard slog that is needed within the campaign groups, we also have to keep in mind um, the ultimate goal of changing the system. We will need an eco-socialist revolution, as you know, Kim was saying, we will need to change the system to solve this, this crisis. Um, we do have to bring more people with us, within the movements, to the view that um, as long as a small minority 
of people controls the economy and runs it in their interests, the ecological crisis will worsen. So the Repower Port Augusta campaign has come a, a long way over the last four years. It's still got a long way to go, but um, and the unconventional gas campaign as well. Um, but they are starting to achieve some gains and starting to have some wins, which is really exciting. Um, and it's only by doing this hard work and hard slog of the grassroots campaigning, getting out there, talking to people, building broad movements and demonstrating that broad report through mass support, through mass action, that these campaigns have got to where they are today. And that's what it's ultimately going to take to take them further forward and for them to win as well. So just in wrapping up a bit, and it's the same book that Kim mentioned, which is a great book, and I've actually got a copy here if anyone wants to grab one. Um, John Bellamy Foster, one of the leading uh, eco-socialist theorists. Um, 21st century Marxists have to learn from the mistakes of 20th century Marxists, and this includes the fact that we ignore ecological issues at our own peril. There can be no ecological, true eco ecological revolution that's not socialist, no true socialist revolution that is not ecological. So as we continue to struggle for an eco-socialist society, I'm sure we'll get told that our demands are too radical or idealistic or naively delusional. But I think what is actually delusional is to think that we can continue going along this present system of destruction under a capitalist system when we're already feeling the wrath of nature a one degree temperature rise. It's delusional to think that a system that prioritises profit above all else and is controlled by a tiny minority of society can adequately provide a just and sustainable future for working people and for billions of people on this earth. So Marx and Engels famously urged the workers of the world to unite because they had a world to win and nothing to lose but their chains. Well, now the stakes are higher than ever. We still have a world to win, but we also have a world to lose. So we can't guarantee that we'll win, but we can guarantee that we'll fight. Um, and I'll finish with a quote from Naomi Klein, um, who's also a great, great communicator on this issue. Um, Responding to climate change requires that we break every rule in the free market playbook and that we do so with great urgency. A green left worldview which rejects mere reformism and challenges the centrality of profit in our economy offers humanity's best hope of overcoming these overlapping crises. And um, I just got some further reading if people want more info. Um, there's heaps of good resources out there. And I've got a few if anyone wants to talk to me afterwards. There's a few little pamphlets that are really easy and simple to read and accessible. How to make an eco-socialist revolution. This one is about Latin American responses. If the climate were a bank, it would have already been saved. Pretty great quote from Chavez there. Uh, and change the system, not the climate, as well as a couple of John Bellamy Foster's books. Um, and also the great book by Ian Angus and Simon Butler, both eco-socialists, and that will be really relevant as well if you're going to the next talk about um, racism and overpopulation. So, yeah.